it was fully covered in trees and brush. So I actually dug out by hand a lot of stumps, like a lot to make this garden. Um, I was toiling really, really hard the past year and a half. And I learned um, one of the strategies I used is Epsom salt. So I'll drill holes in the stump and put Epsom salt in it, leave it for about eight weeks. When you come back, the stump is like really soft. It's like it'll turn to dust huh. if you leave it long enough. And if you keep refilling it too, like I'll kind of come back whenever it rains and refill it. Um, and yeah, it gets down into the roots, makes it really easy to pull up. Some of them were harder than others. Some of them I had to like leave for the season and pull them out in the fall. But I had a lot of fun with it. It's extremely hard, but like I really like hard physical labor. So I really liked pulling up stumps. It was a good, good activity last year. This is the Farm Hop Life podcast, a traveling homestead family. I'm Matt DeRosier. On the Farm Hop Life podcast, we learn what it takes to grow your own food from everyday people. Could be a college student grows tomatoes and salad greens on their apartment patio, a former VP of marketing for Del Taco now raising cattle in Montana, or someone who hasn't had a homestead in over 10 years. This show is aimed at teaching you what it takes to make homesteading work for you, that we all make mistakes, we all have bad days, but we can reach out and help one another thrive in giving you the confidence needed to go feed yourself. Good morning. Uh, it's not, it's, it's not too often. I have a morning interview, especially at five 30 in the morning here. So it's not too often. I'm even awake this early. I got to see the sunrise this morning though. It was nice. Is that unusual for you? Yeah. I'm, I'm like a nighttime person for sure. Gotcha. I usually wake up right about now. <laughs> gotcha. So you're a, uh, you're in Eastern Canada, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you do up there? uh <laughs> chill out um i have to so i'm from ontario originally ottawa the capital of canada um kind of a big fairly big city um and i'm used to a very different pace of life moving out here has been uh really interesting so i yeah i mostly relax i chill out um i do work i do like marketing and admin work from home work from rv um and yeah work from I, rv <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I live in my my 1990 Pace Arrow. It's an old shitbox. Um, lots to replace. You can see there's like a wall panel that's been replaced back there. I need to do some more work this spring. Got to do the floors and everything. And yeah, I uh, I grow food. I snowshoe. I chill out with my cats, sit in the hammock. Um, yeah, getting used to a slower pace of life and the homesteading life. How long have you been at this current place? I have been here since November 2021, so about a year and a half now. Okay. What do you do for heat? I'm assuming it's wood heat, where like inside your RV. Yeah, I got the wood stove back there. There you go. Nice. Um, originally, so when I first moved out here, I had a cubic mini wood stove. Um, too small. Too small. Really? Like, heated it mostly um but it only lasts like maybe two hours maybe if you're lucky like an hour to an hour and a half with that tiny little firebox so this year i replaced it with like a full-size wood stove um so i'm super toasty right now <laughs> uh because i was gonna say i've heard really really good things about the the cubic minis i wonder if it's yeah. an installation issue it is. It is. Like, this is a glorified yeah. styrofoam box. Like, it is not well insulated at all. Um, there are, yeah, a lot of problems with uh, insulation underneath as well. Um, my biggest qualm with it is just, like, how long the fire lasts. Like, it doesn't last through the night at all, um, which is the biggest problem. Because, like, I could have probably done most of the winter with the Cubic Mini. Uh, and I didn't mind it for the first half of the winter. Like, I really put off installing the new one. Um, but then we had a weekend that was, like, minus 45. And I was like, I should probably put in the oh, new geez. one. Oh, <laughs> jeez. That's going to be rough with the Cubic Mini. And even with the big stove, it got down to minus 8 inside. Um, Holy smokes. For night. Yeah, it was pretty intense. So I'm glad I switched. Um, but I, I didn't mind it in terms of heat. The first year was rough, uh, supplemented with propane heat. I hated that. I was here with my ex-husband for the first year. And um, yeah, he couldn't stand just the cubic mini. But this year I did fine with it. 
But yeah, it doesn't last through the night, which sucks. It sucks. Just had to throw in that flex. Just like, yeah, he's kind of a little whatever about it. And it was it was fine. I brushed it off. I'd sleep in the snow. You kind of skipped there for a second. Uh, I didn't catch that. I'd I'd sleep in the snow if I didn't get so wet. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. Honestly, like I could do it. I've done a good amount of winter camping. I did okay with it. Even this morning, I woke up, it was zero degrees in here. It was okay. I'm I'll just, used to it. I'll just kill a tauntaun and sleep inside that. <laughs> exactly. Climb inside. <laughs> That's really funny. So, so, you just, you're like you moving from Ontario, in Ontario to where you are now. Like, it seems like you're in like the middle of the woods or something in a bus, kind of like uh, into the wild style. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> How did you, so like just a change of pace, like how did you really get over there? It was a lot of things. So I kind of always knew I was supposed to be here. I don't know why. Um, I just, I called it the prophecy when I was a teenager. I just had this like inkling that I was supposed to end up in like this exact spot on the East Coast. Um, I had never been here before. Like I'd been out to the East Coast. I've been to New Brunswick, PEI. Um, but I'd never been here specifically, but I just knew, like I looked at a map and it was kind of a whole bunch of things that stacked up and I was like, I'm supposed to end up there. Uh, cause when I was a kid, I, I just knew I wanted to do homesteading. Um, I don't really know where it came Parents from. didn't like, do it. Grandparents didn't do it. Not at all. No. Hmm. Like they, I grew up in downtown Ottawa. Like I was a city girl for sure. I was kind of an indoor kid too. So I don't really know where it came from. I want to say I could be wrong, but I think the seed was planted because I was playing Harvest Moon video games. And I, like, <laughs> I loved really Harvest got Moon. into that. Um, but as I aged, like it just sort of seemed like the only thing that made sense to me. It seemed like the only way to live. And so I knew that that's what I wanted to do someday. And for some reason, I knew that it was supposed to be right here on the East Coast. I don't know why. Um, But then, you know, life happened. Uh, I kind of built a career that required me to be in the city. And I started thinking, I don't know how I'm going to really get out there like I don't know if this dream is ever going to come to fruition uh and then the pandemic hit and you know I was kind of the type of person I had like a lot of volunteer jobs multiple jobs going on um always just out and about I did like a lot of stuff in the art scene in Ottawa um and so when we couldn't leave the house like I had nothing to do like I was used to very like hustle and bustle um and my life kind of came crashing down on me a little bit like I really see that yeah for a while um and then me and my ex-husband we did a lot of camping we did crown land camping which is like a thing in Canada where the land is like owned by the crown I have a lot of feelings about it but it benefits me in some way because you can go camping out there for free so you can sure. just find a spot set up uh, and we did a lot of that technically we weren't supposed to like you're supposed to be inside and not going camping legally but we were out there like I'm not gonna stay inside I'm sorry <laughs> so we did a little bit of winter camping that year and then we went out for my birthday in August um, and it was that trip we went up to northern Ontario you know as we were like staying inside I kind of got really into like eco building and just like dreaming of something like building a house, getting some land, doing something. Uh, And so we went up to Northern Ontario to kind of like scout different places we could maybe move. Um, Went all the way up to Cochrane, Ontario, which is kind of the furthest you can go on the road. Beyond that, there's there's a train that goes up further, but there aren't really roads. Um, And for some reason, I thought that was going to be like the place. Got up there very uninhabitable in the woods like the trees are like this like a deer couldn't even get through them it was dark it was like really kind of gloomy and unpleasant uh so we stayed there a night and then immediately got up early in the morning and went a little more south um and then we found this great spot by a lake did some fishing it was a very strange trip i learned about giant water bugs that trip i don't know if you know about these they're like this big they got big no i Oh really? Uh, I I saw it. I was like, "Oh, cool, giant bug." I later found out they like they have like venomous bites, pincer things, what? Uh, and they 
hurt like heck. Uh, giant. I've never seen a bug that big <laughs> in person in the wild. I uh, also had like a motorcyclist show up to our campsite in the middle of the night looking for his keys. Like it was all just a very strange trip. My ex-husband was thrown off by it. I thought it was great. I was having an awesome time. And there was just something on that trip that clicked where I was like, I can't stay in the city anymore. Like I need to be out here. I need to be out in the woods. Uh, so I went home a week later, I bought the RV and I said, come hell or high water, like we're getting out there. So the original plan was to drive around can crown land spots uh, and just kind of like gorilla garden forage. I'm really into that kind of thing. Um, but the RV was looking harder and harder to fix up. Like it does drive, but would it pass an inspection? Eh. Um, right. So we were considering options and we had fixed up some of it, but we were thinking, you know, what do we really want to do? And we started looking at bits of land. Um, and I said, you know, look out on the East Coast. Like I just, I have a feeling I've always felt that I'm supposed to end up there. And then this piece of land was there, dirt cheap. Uh, and I said, let's do it. Like, why not? Um, so bought it really quick. Uh, within, I, so I bought it about two years ago now, and it took about like six to eight months to get out here. And yeah, I, like, I could not stay in the city anymore. I said like, no, nah, we're going out in the winter. I don't care. <laughs> like I cannot do another winter here. So we came out in November, did the whole winter was really intense. Um, and yeah, that's how I ended up here. <laughs> that's crazy. It must've been like your ancestral DNA was just like screaming at you or something. Just like, get out the, of this concrete jungle. What is this even? Exactly. Yeah. This and I actually not where you belong. finding out, I didn't know, I don't know my biological dad that well, but apparently he's from out here. So Ooh. it's like, oh, there's like a connection here. Maybe I like felt this stirring in my heart calling me to this, <laughs> this location. That's funny. So you were, you said you got into like eco homes as well. So do you have plans? Uh, for the property, like I'm gonna live in an earth ship or something. <laughs> I did. I was thinking log cabin. Um, the area where I'm at is pretty flat. So I kind of wanted to do like a Wafati style thing, which is like an earth sheltered home um, with like thermal inertia, but it's too flat for it here. So I was sure. thinking log house, um, considering different options. I'm still kind of like on the fence about it, but like last month I was thinking maybe I just want to stick to the RV for now because eventually I do want a bigger property. This is only a half acre. Like it's really okay. small. I've got a bunch of forest attached, but like I can't build on someone else's land. I can go forage and take their maple syrup, but I can't like build a house. So I'm kind of on the fence about it. You're I that neighbor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's like nobody around anyway. It's all like, you know, dirt pits, industrial so I don't think Dirt anyone pits. even knows I'm out there. There That's is funny. down, like I own a section of ATV trail and down the trail, there's this big dirt pit that actually there's a company that dumps a bunch of peat moss that they can't sell there. So I got to fill my whole garden with like reclaimed. Holy peat crap. Moss. Yeah, I wouldn't buy it because of the sustainability issues. But like, if it's there for free, like, hell yeah. So that worked out great right. for my garden. Um, pretty much the whole area is like that. Like there's so much I can just go like, grab stuff like tons of wild blueberries I have like a huge harvest and the syrup and everything like I and everyone out here is just on that vibe where you can just kind of do what you want so it's like pretty sweet um but yeah so I was thinking like maybe I want more garden and growing space and I'll stick to the RV and not build the cabin and aim for that on a bigger property in the future I don't know but that's where I've settled now gotcha okay I um I'm also into like alternative building methods. And one of my favorite ones is, uh, is rammed earth. And mm -hmm. I wanted to take a, it was like a week or two week course up in Canada where the, they make the walls like two feet thick or something and have like styrofoam in the middle and all this stuff, man, it would be, it'd be that, that would be like my dream home would be to have a, a rammed earth house. Just, I love the way it looks. Um, I mean, it's just engineered sandstone for anybody that hasn't uh, hasn't seen it before. It looks looks amazing. 
So. Yeah, it does. It's beautiful. And yeah. I considered like an Earthship style thing too. And I think if I were to do the earth ship, I would do like, instead of the tires, do like earth bags or rammed earth or something like that. Cause right. the tires, I hear a lot of people have like off gassing issues with them. Uh, so I was like thinking of creative ways to do that. I'm still kind of into that. I love the earth ship design. I think that's super cool. It's very popular in like this sort of area. Like Quebec loves earth ships. I don't know why. <laughs> have you been in a Wufati? I have not been in one, no. Okay. I'm like very fascinated by them though. I'm assuming you've heard of Paul Wheaton. Yeah, I actually worked so, for Paul Wheaton. You worked for him? I work for him now, yeah. Oh, you, do you really? That's yeah. fascinating. What do you what do you do for Paul? Uh, I'm one of his assistants, so yeah, like marketing admin, that kind of thing. I did not know that. So you're the ones that send out the emails like here's a tiny ad and then like that's you? <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. I, mine actually went out today, so <laughs> you can read from me. How about that? Uh, <laughs> so I've been to Paul's place. Oh, really? Stupid internet. Uh, he's not that far from me, like two hours or something. Okay. Um, so, like, yeah, I've been to, like, his, like, Wufati and, like, toured the whole property and, and everything. It's pretty cool. It's cool out there. Yeah, yeah, obviously I know a lot about it. I've still never been, but yeah, I'm like real into what he's doing out there. He should fly you out just so uh just so you can get a feel for it. I mean, like it's only to his benefit, right? Just Yeah, and I'm sure he would. I w one of the other assistants did invite me to come do cooking for one of the events, but I'm not big on traveling cuz one of the things with COVID, I have kidney scarring, so I'm like pretty mm. high risk, so I'm like kind of avoiding traveling in general right now otherwise i totally would especially sure. like cook for an event hell yeah why not <laughs> yeah we had we had a uh, wood-fired pizza out there with um one of the uh rocket mass stoves yeah. it was it was nice like up yeah. on a mountaintop basically it's cool love that i want to build one this year that's in my plans <laughs> yeah um so it looks sorry with the with your mug. It looks like you're drinking beer this early in the morning. It is a beer <laughs> mug, yeah. It's iced tea. <laughs> Could have lied. <laughs> yeah, or like I'm drinking straight maple syrup or something. <laughs> I actually did that yesterday. I like had some maple water in there. <laughs> Good little pick me up. It's a different kind of pick me up. <laughs> so, so tell me about your about your garden. Uh, you've you've been at this property for a year and a half. Um, what's your garden look like? Yeah, garden's pretty big so far. Uh, and that's one of the the big things I got kind of attention for on Twitter, which was really cool. Because for me, it's like, you know, it's just what my heart calls me to do. And I post it and people are like, wow, it's so amazing. You can grow this much food and just like, do it. Just go out there and do it. Um, so the garden is about half the property, if I count like the orchard space. Um, and I did a bunch of raised garden beds, like huge raised garden beds. I think because I knew I had access to all the like discarded peat moss uh, and the dirt at the dirt pit, I was like, I can do as much as I want. I can fill these garden beds um, as high as I need to. Uh, but it's a lot of work to pull dirt up and down a trail and mix it with compost and shovel it in there. So that was like a little over ambitious, but it's huge. Um, I have like a big 25 by 15 um, garden bed that's like, you can like go in and around it. Okay. Um, very space efficient. I got the inspiration from that, from um, that chestnut guy, the the one who plants the chestnut trees. Do you know who I'm talking about? Oh, shoot. The name. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I don't remember the name, but I think I know yeah. who you're talking about. Yeah, he posted something about like raised garden bed designs. And I was like, oh, my God, genius. So I designed this kind of based on that. And then there's like an addition to that um, that my ex-husband was growing cannabis in. That's like higher up and really big. Uh, and then I've got another one beside that that's like. I want to say like eight by 10, maybe a little bigger. Um, and then I have all the in-ground beds as well. I've got some four by fours, like four of those. And then I'm going to add more raised beds for brassicas this year as well. Uh, and then I had like a patch somewhere for like squashes and stuff, probably like 
hmm, five by eight ish. And then I kind of just, I don't know, I do whatever my heart calls me to. So there's like a big empty stump out there that I've turned into like a planter with mint and stuff. And so that's cool everywhere, all over. And then the orchard space, still very much in its infancy. Obviously, I've only been here a year, um, but pretty tiny for an orchard. But I've got about six fruit trees out there. Nice. What are you growing for fruit trees? Um, apples, pears, and then I've got like a, a butternut tree as well. I don't know how okay. well that's going to work out. The nursery, I got these trees from I don't, a beautiful place. I loved going there, but all the trees had issues. And I'm kind of worried mm. that the butternut has canker. There was like some very concerning things on it. And then the pear trees had pear blister mite. And then they all came with green aphids on it. And it was... A whole terrible adventure. But yeah, that's that's the plan. And uh, I also have a crab apple tree, Dolgo crab apples, which are edible. They're so yummy. I had some last year. It fruited. That was awesome. Um, everything else, I don't know how well it's going to go. I'm a little bit worried. Everything's going to get girdled by um, voles right now. One of the trees definitely did. So I might have to replace some of the apples. But Oh, no. <laughs> It's my fault for not protecting them. You know, I knew I had to, and then I didn't do it. How would you protect a tree from voles? I'm curious. Um, my plan was to just like wrap some chicken wire around the base, but there are some different strategies people use. I wanted to do bone sauce, but apparently that does not work well for voles as much as it does for like deers and other nibblers. Uh, mm. The voles have been a problem. The voles are like my nemesis out here, I have to say. <laughs> Yeah, because couldn't they just like go underneath the chicken wire or do you like lay it down like on the ground? So I would like wrap it kind of tightly around the the trunk of it. Oh, like an inverse cone? Yeah, kind of. Okay, okay. And then I was thinking about that stump. Like if you don't have equipment, like I'm assuming you don't have a tractor or anything. So that'd be a lot of unnecessary work to get the stump out. So you might as well just like utilize it how you can. I like that. You know what? So this land had there'd never been anything built here. It had never been cleared. It was like fully treed. A lot of them were dead trees. Um, mm. The people who owned it before us, they took down a few trees and made like a little U shaped drive in so they could put their camper. But like, it was fully covered in trees and brush. So I actually dug out by hand a lot of stumps, like a lot to make this garden. Um, I was toiling really, really hard the past year and a half. And I learned um, one of the strategies I used is Epsom salt. So I'll drill holes in the stump and put Epsom salt in it, leave it for about eight weeks. When you come back, the stump is like really soft. It's like, it'll turn to dust huh. if you long enough and if you keep refilling it too like i'll kind of come back whenever it rains and refill it um and yeah it gets down into the roots makes it really easy to pull up some of them were harder than others some of them i had to like leave for the season and pull them out in the fall but i had a lot of fun with it it's extremely hard but like i really like hard physical labor so i really liked pulling up stumps it was a good good activity last year hmm I've never heard that before. People pour all sorts of stupid chemicals to get rid of stumps and exactly, blah, blah, yeah. blah, when they can just be using. I've never heard of the Epsom salt being used that way. That's interesting. Whenever I tell anyone, they don't believe me, but I swear by it. It really does work well if you do it mm. like soon enough. It works. Sure, sure. But that one stump, you're like, I've had enough stumps. I'm not doing that one. Well, that one was kind of pretty. Like it was a tree that had fallen and it was all hollow inside. And it, I don't know, the way it like sat there, I just, I said, I'm going to keep you. You're very pretty. <laughs> That's fair. That's you're like, like the way it's centered in the garden too. It's like a nice little centerpiece. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> nice little centerpiece. You put Christmas lights around it. <laughs> just cause just treat it nice. Yeah, exactly. It's my friend. <laughs> so why did you do raised garden beds there? Just because like, so the existing soil conditions and then adding in the peat moss and compost and then um, just easier on your back, like easier to maintain or. Yeah, easy on the back. Um, like I do have the in-ground ones. I have some pretty big in-ground planting areas and the soil definitely needs some work. Like I think I, I expected more organic matter 
then was actually in there just because the whole garden area before I put the garden in there was covered in like three feet deep of brush and like detritus and leaves and stuff. And so I thought that there was going to be a lot of organic matter worked into the soil already. Um, there was some and it's like very spotty, like certain locations are more waterlogged or more full of organic matter than others throughout the garden. Um, but yeah, I just kind of wanted a mix. Like I knew if I did raised garden beds and I filled them myself, I would definitely get a harvest out of that. And I was right. Like the in-ground garden beds last year didn't do great. Um, Okay. They're, they're not like super compacted, but they're not like super loose either. And the nutrients in the soil are definitely lacking. Uh, the soil out here does not have a lot of phosphorus. That was a challenge I ran into. So yeah, everything I put in the in-ground beds while it did grow, didn't grow great. Like I had um, pickling cucumbers out there and then pickling cucumbers in a raised bed as well. And the difference between the two hmm. was like really remarkable. The the pickling cucumbers coming out of the in-ground beds were like oftentimes yellow. Oftentimes they would get like round or misshapen. The leaves were a lot smaller and paler. The beans I grew out there were garbage. Like you would get like two pods on a plant and yeah, very pale leaves. Um, so a lot of things didn't grow great out there, but I used that opportunity to um, kind of see what weeds come up, what like native plants will grow on their own um, and then save seeds from those and just experiment with that. So that was cool as well uh, and has really inspired my like planting strategy for next year. I want to work in a lot more native plants. And so seeing what just grows on its own was very cool. Um, but the raised beds did help me I, like actually get a really pretty substantial harvest for first year. So I'm glad I did it. So, man, I lost my question. Um, shoot. No, I can't remember what it was. It was something about, um, nope. Nope. It's gone. That's all right. So what, what other things have worked well for you? You, you have, you have rabbits. Yeah. Um, I initially wanted to get chickens first cause I really like eggs. I eat a lot of eggs. Um, but I'm kind of creeped out by birds, if I'm honest. Like, they're dirty and kind of creepy and weird. So I think... They are very like, dirty. Yeah, they're very dirty. And, like, I don't have running water. So that was, like, a problem for me. Mm. Um, but it was, like, right when I moved out here, I just had this thought of, like, why don't I get meat rabbits? Like, I had never, ever thought about this before. I don't know even where it came from or what inspired it. Um but it kind of like baked in the back of my mind as I prepared the garden and was like, oh, I'm going to have to get chickens at some point this year. Never ended up getting the chickens, but I did get the rabbits. Um, fortunately, there was a, a woman about 15 minutes from here who breeds angoras and meat rabbits like a California, New Zealand mix. Um, and I was really excited by that because I saw she had accidentally, one of her angoras escaped and impregnated one of her meat rabbits. And so she had these mixes that she was trying to get rid of. And like, I saw that and was like, that's really cool. Right. I want one of those. And actually I want to mess around with that more. So what I ended up doing is getting a mix buck. And then I got an angora buck as well. And then I got a New Zealand, California doe. And I want to kind of play with the genetics a little bit there and breed for the furs because the mixes, the half Angora, half meat rabbit, um, they have like really nice thick skin. Apparently, like it tans mm. really well. There's a place that tans hides about 50 minutes from here as well. Um, and she drops all her hides off there. And they were like, these are amazing. Like, these are the best you've ever dropped off. They're really easy to flesh, really easy to tan, which is unique for rabbits. Oftentimes rabbit furs are a little hard to get. The skin is kind of thin, um, but they have really nice thick skin. So yeah, mm -hmm. I've been trying to breed for the furs, which has been really cool. But of course, one of the benefits of having rabbits is the manure is like really great. You can just put it right in the garden without composting it. So that was really exciting as well. And I've really enjoyed the meat. So that's been a very cool experience. And I'm, I'm excited to see where that goes in terms of the breeding. So you're just going kind of wild with uh with the breeding of the rabbits you just like here's this freak thing and here's like there's like another freak thing let's see what happens <laughs> yeah pretty much i like the first fur. litter 
ended up being um, the doe is like completely black self coloring. Um, and the buck is like a beautiful cream fawn coloring. And I really, mm. really like his fur. And somehow the babies they produce, she had 11 babies in this litter. Every single one was completely black. As they grew up, some mm. of them got like slight white tips. Some um, one of them that I'm leaving for last has like a kind of a cream tip. And I think that's really cool. But I want some different colors. So I'm going to do another round or two with that buck. And then one of those babies I'm going to grow into a, a breeder and mix in more Angora until I get like something cool. Um, a couple of this litter turned out like really big beefy ones like the buck. Um that sired them, I guess. Um, and beautiful furs. Like I just uh, slaughtered one the other day and like very easy. Slaughtered. <laughs> and like, yeah, I'm like, if I can get more big chonkers like that, I'll be pretty happy. So a little bit blending your, like your homesteading with your living situation being in an RV. So like, I remember my question, by the way, uh, you said, you were trying to grow pickling cucumbers in both in ground and raised beds. So how does, how do you can anything? Like, do you can't, like, can you do it? What, what can you do in your RV? Like it's gotta be like limited. Yeah, it's pretty limited. I have to say like not having consistent refrigeration and um, like running water, like those are big challenges. Um, did do some canning, like water bath canning. I would like to this year build an outdoor kitchen. That was something I wanted to do last mm. year, but, you know, things happened um, and didn't get to it. So I'd like to build something kind of rockety. Uh, I do have the plans for like a rocket forge slash canner, and I'd like to do like pressure canning um, as well as like a rocket oven and everything out there. I'd love to do more dehydrating. I really think dehydrating would be a good idea out here. Um, but I also want to build a root cellar. I'm considering like a Wafati freezer slash cooler, hmm. something like that. Um, but yeah, it is it is fairly limited. Like all I could really do was dry beans and uh, water bath canning for pickles. I did a couple different types of pickles. But yeah, it's it's not ideal. That's for sure. And especially with the temperature fluctuation during the night times in the winter, like I worry about some of those canned goods. I'll, every now and then I'll hear like a jar go bing. And I'm like, I don't know where that was from, what that was. I'm gonna, maybe going to avoid the pickles in the fridge. Oh, man. <laughs> it's kind of a bummer. <laughs> yeah. Then for your water, do you have to go like get, I don't know, 100 gallons at a time, 50 gallons at a time and like go I get some and so haul it back? 20 gallons at a time uh there's a spring near here that produces like really good okay water, like probably the best water i've ever had so i'm very happy about that i'm obsessed with it uh it won like awards and stuff it's really good water in really? like an international water tasting competition yeah so that's just hmm. like up the road so i can get it at like any of the local stores and i do so i have about like 20 gallons on hand at a time um, which is like pretty adequate. I think it'll be tougher in the summer. Uh, one thing is like, I don't drive. Uh, I never learned to drive. So living in the middle of the woods is a challenge. So I can't just like go out and get more water. I do have to keep some on hand. And I do think that'll be probably not as much as I need in the summer once I have to start um, giving the animals like fresh water instead of snow. I've been giving them snow through a lot of the winter, which they're doing really well with. But hmm. yeah. I'll You're just making them really hardy. You're going to have exactly. the hardiest rabbits of all time. <laughs> There's like a meat rabbit group I'm in on Facebook and somebody was like, you can just give them snow. Like in the wild, that's what they eat. It'll make them really hardy. And some people were very offended by that. They were like, no, these are domesticated. Like they, they won't last with that kind of thing. But mine are doing great. So hmm. you know, it works. Nice. Do you do you have a bike then, or do you just walk everywhere? I walk. Yeah. Um. My neighbors are like very nice. It's a very like kind community around here. So, uh, they will help me out, grab me things, or drive me places. Um, I'm dating someone who lives about like two hours from here, and he'll come every weekend or so, and I'll go do errands. But, um, for you know. Like I, I was out here for 
a month without leaving the property. Like, I don't have to really do a lot. Um, mostly, like, thank you to the the good graces of my neighbors. Like, they'll drop me off water and stuff. That's really helpful. Mm. Um, That's rare yeah, to like, find community like that. Yeah, it is. You, like, like hit, like, really all, there's, like, I don't know. There's, like, ten things that people look for in, like, a community and uh, property. And I, you, it sounds like you hit, like, a lot of them. So. Yeah, like, I'm like, my garden beds are all done with like, free or super cheap slab wood from local mills and stuff. And like, my rabbit hutches are built with cast off wood from one of my neighbors, he just dropped off like a huge load of like, random odds and ends of wood that he had. So like, you know, I get stuff for free all the time, whether it's scavenging it or foraging it or like being gifted it like, a very supportive community out here. And like even the neighbors, they're like, I, so many of my neighbors have been like, wow, your garden beds are so cool. You know, down at that dirt bit, you can get some really good peat moss. And I'm like, oh, I know, I am well aware, but we're all kind of like on this like secret vibe of like, as long as you don't say something, you can go take sure. a bunch of dirt from there. That's awesome. <laughs> That's really, really great. Like people work, I mean, they like work like their day job really hard to in order to just buy the stuff that they need when they could work almost equally hard to just get it for free and then still save, you know, their money from their day job when you're you just you make it seem so like so easy, just almost almost effortless, like things just come to you. <laughs> yeah, they really have. Like, I, I I'm just constantly surprised by it. Like, every time I kind of need something or I'm a little bit worried, it seems to just show up at my door or just like appear in my hand somehow. It's been like very fortuitous. I don't think many people are this lucky in their homesteading journey, especially like, yeah, the way I'm doing it is pretty intense, pretty tough. Um, there's a lot that is not provided for me. So it's funny how much like is provided for me. Like literally yesterday I was just doing my work and everything. I'm really swamped with work right now. And, uh, my neighbor just showed up at my door and brought me like a whole lunch meal and like did not say a word. I like didn't even respond to what I was saying, just shuffles away, gives me like chicken and vegetables. And like, they're no just way. very kind people here for real. Hmm. Wow. That's because when you're saying like, yeah, I just wandered into their woods and uh, like get like maple syrup from their, or I guess sap at that point, but yeah. um, from stupid internet. Uh, that I was like, hmm, do they, do they know? Do they care? They must know, right? Most, yeah, most of them know. Like, I think the people who own the forest next to me are either loggers or they're just like never there. They don't use it. Um, gotcha. It's like completely wooded. So I don't know that they're even like paying attention necessarily, but like, yeah, the permanent neighbors around here, we all kind of know each other and know what we're up to. And like, everyone kind of gives each other tips on how to like, skirt the law a little bit um, when we need to. So it's kind That's of what I like to hear. Yeah, it's like this like known secret. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, kind of like you gotta, gotta put a little bit of time in and before they can trust you, I'm sure. And then it's like, hey, by the way, like, you, you, you seem cool. Let's over here is a thing. I'll bring you some lunch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's it's nice. like, I'm surprised by how quickly they trusted me too. I didn't even have to put that much time in like hmm. the neighbor who brought me lunch yesterday. How I met him is he showed up at my door because he thought that um, there had been like a string of thefts around here. And a couple people had stopped when they came by on the ATV trail to like warn me, like, you know, my catalytic converter got stolen right out my yard or someone stole my ATV like right from my house in the middle of the night. Like these thieves are bold, just like watch out. Um, so right when I moved here, there had been this string of thefts and one of the neighbors thought that it was us. Uh, so he shows up here like banging on the door thinking that we're like thieves. He thought we were like an old friend of his he had heard was living in an RV nearby. And then we opened the door and he's kind of shocked a little bit. And he's like a little bit suspicious. Are we the thieves? I don't know. Um, started kind of a weird, like slightly adversarial relationship. But then really quickly, he was like, oh, welcome. Like, they're just very, very welcoming people here. And then he's like, 
do you eat pork? The next day he shows up with some pork from his pig and like invites hmm. us over for Christmas dinner and everything. So it's like, yeah, once people realize you're kind of like on a good vibe, I think also because I'm like really rough in it. Like I'm living the lifestyle that's typical out here, but like on a hundred, like they look sure. at me and think I'm crazy. They're like, why don't you hook up to the power grid? Like this is insane. But because they see I'm on that vibe, they're like, okay, you're good people. Uh, and we just kind of, yeah, just melded into a community really fast. I think people, when people do see like when hard work is, is shown, just they, they have kind of like a, not, not so much like a, Oh, bless your heart type of thing, but uh, like, you know, respect. Yeah. You know, you're, exactly. you're doing it. You're doing it the way you want to do it. That looks really hard. That's not for me. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll throw you some lunch. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. And we all kind of know, like, if one of us needs help, if we need to get some work done or whatever, like we'll, we'll jump in and help out. Like one of my neighbors, this old man too, uh, helped build the driveway. Uh, and he's like, like, nice. he looks old. Like, I don't know how he even like did all that work, but he's like hauling big buckets of dirt and chopping down trees for me, stacking things like everyone's willing to like pitch in and help out if you're on the vibe. It's a very cool attitude out here. That's awesome. What, what's some stuff that hasn't worked for you? Like tried this thing, flutter. Wow. <laughs> Failed miserably. Um, yeah, a few things. Um, well, melons, first of all, I tried growing a couple melons that did melons. Not what well. zone are you? Like two and I'm a half? Zone five ish. Okay. Um, oh, you might get some of the warm air from the, five. from the ocean. Yeah, but it's also like this is like the coldest part of the ocean up here. Okay. Like I'm pretty north. Um, there's like maybe maybe two months if you're bold where you can go swimming because like the waters are frigid <laughs> and the the cold winds coming in from the coast are like intense. Um, so not is that a your lot. line? Is that your line? Like I'll I'll <laughs> I'll live in a bus at negative forty five, but I am not swimming in that water. <laughs> You know, I still will. I'm like down for it. Okay. I got like my Wim Hof breath and everything. I'll get okay. in there. But uh, yeah, it's it's tough for sure. I'm not a big swimmer as it is. I kind of just sit there. So just I'll float. go out as early as I can and just kind of like, <sighs> it's good for the body. Good for the immune system. I'm really sure. into like Nordic thermal cycling. I don't know if you know anything about this. The like sauna and then the cold plunge thing. Okay. Yeah. You cycle between. I see. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm kind of into it. I like it. Um, I won't go swimming for long periods of time for sure. But yeah, there's not a lot of like the temperature regulation. And I don't know, apparently it's zone five. I really don't believe it because the growing season is extremely short. And that was my challenge with the melons as well as a, a lot of things like I can't start seeds indoors really because it gets into like minus temperatures sometimes indoors overnight at the end of the winter right. um, or midwinter. So like I can't really start seedlings. I have to direct seed most things and it's a very short growing season. Um, like back home in Ottawa, it's zone five too, but it's like you can plant like a whole month earlier. That's a lot more time to be growing. Um, so yeah, there are some definite challenges with that and, uh, yeah, definite challenges with like the soil that I'm working with. Um, there was one thing that really did not work out well for me. I'm trying to remember what it is. I kind of just, I almost forget the failures a lot of the time because everything out here is an experiment. Like I really don't sure. expect anything to work. So if it doesn't work, it's like, okay, well, I just focus on the things that do work. Um, would have been nice if that worked, but hey, whatever. <laughs> yeah, it would have been cool, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. There have, yeah, been challenges. Everything's a challenge. I think um, a lot of the the building things have not happened the way I wanted them to yet for a number of reasons. Um, yeah, the RV has been a challenge. There have been many failures in here. <laughs> Hard to pin them down. It's just, yeah, 
unique to the lifestyle that I've chosen, like no running water, no consistent heat, no electricity. There are a lot of things that just like don't work out how I want them to. It is right. what it is. Yeah, the climate for sure. Like your, you might be in zone five, but your microclimate is probably like maybe like a zone four or even like three something, three A, three B. Like yeah, I mean, maybe having a whole month like shaved off of your growing season. That's that's a big deal. It is, yeah. Like when I can't it's already limited, like June fifteenth ish. Like yeah, that's, that's about what I'm in zone five as well. So okay, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. like, yeah, short season. It's it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, even like in the best year, you get like maybe 100, maybe 120 days of growing. Mm -hmm. And that's that's it. You better. There was one time we had a an early, it got on like warm early in like May, mid-May, mm -hmm. maybe late May. And my wife was like, should we, you know, everybody's planting in their garden. Like you, when you drive around, you can see people are planting in the garden. Like, should we plant? I'm like, no, it's too, it's too early. We're going to get that. Like our last frost date is early June. Yep. And so sure enough, frost came in early June. And like, I don't know if it just like toasted people's like tomatoes that they planted or whatever in their gardens. But yeah, it was, it was worth the wait. Like, yeah, I had that cool, last uh, year too. it was yeah. like shockingly warm for like what it is historically here and I was like should I shouldn't I but everyone says the full moon in June so I waited and I'm glad it did because like two or three days beforehand got that last frost hmm. what's the full moon in June I haven't heard this uh, I don't know everyone says plant after the full moon in June and last hmm. year it was like pretty late I think it was around June 14th so I planted most June 15th uh, this year it's a little bit hmm. earlier so we'll, um, we'll see um, how it goes if it's accurate I'm gonna have to remember that one see see if that if that rings true this year like yeah hmm. pay attention to it I'll be interested I'll put uh I'll, I'll look up when the full moon is here and then uh full moon and then see how that correlates with the last frost date yeah i do hmm. i think it's like june 4th or something i could be wrong okay. but it's earlier this year do you just complete side note do you follow any other like astrological like some things with the plantings of like like the your planting season or anything or is it just like yeah. no just do you are you yeah, that? I do. I'm pretty into like astrological things in general especially the moon like i really okay like pace my life based on the moon um and i do pay attention to like astrology in general like i don't know if this is like an off-color comment but a lot of my friends are lesbians and lesbians <laughs> love astrology so i've like okay. learned a lot over the years <laughs> <laughs> just secondhand like what, what what are some other i guess when i said astrology i also meant like a mix of like astronomy so like it could it could be like in either camps and i'm sure like we pissed off both uh <laughs> both sides there the uh but I'm, I'm curious what what other things uh would play into um your growing season using either astronomy or astrology well a lot of it's like foraging stuff i really like foraging especially berries and stuff like i'm I could spot a berry from a mile away, even if it's not fruiting yet. Like I can see the plant. I'm like, oh, there's going to be raspberries here in a couple of months. Uh, really good mm. with the berries and the foraging. And uh, like the June full moon is referred to as the strawberry moon. That's when you start seeing like wild strawberries, stuff like that. So I pay attention to that for foraging purposes. I have kind of spots that I've seen in the woods that I know to come back to around that full moon uh because all the full moons they have like names basically like right. not traditional names but like you've heard that the strawberry moon the the wolf moon that kind of thing and those kind of point to super blood moon or whatever yeah well super blood moon is like a an astronomical event um but like the monthly moons well not monthly sure. there's 13 of them in the year but like they each have like a special name uh that often refers to yeah like what you'll find in the woods around that mm. time. hmm that's interesting I, I i i do not pay that much attention to the the cycles of the mood but maybe i should maybe i should I think you should. I'm a big fan of the moon. Me and the moon were friends. We we talked. Me and a lot. the moon were friends. That's funny. <laughs> maybe maybe 
now that I know, maybe I'll be aware and be like, hmm, maybe there's something to this. You'll just, notice. Just, you'll, just keep you'll that in the back of the back of the mind. And you'll be like, oh, the full moon just happened. <laughs> so what's been the I know we talked about failures, but what's been the biggest challenge that you faced in in homesteading on this property? Um, again, a lot of the things that are just kind of unique to the lifestyle that I've chosen. So yeah, like no running water is really hard. And uh, I have to figure out a better system than I have now. Um, the pests, I think, have been the biggest challenge. Like the pests out here are pretty crazy. I think um, I've heard that this is like kind of pseudoscience and not super proven as real. But um, I don't know if you've heard of this like bricks thing of the the soil quality uh, and like lower soil qualities make it easier for pests to like be attracted to the plants and like eat at them. Um, okay, I've heard I have heard that like if you have like a healthy soil, like it, it everything's balanced, and so like there isn't this invasion of pests. Like it's it's like the Goldilocks zone, right? It's not mm -hmm. too much this. It's not too so. And I think there are a lot of reasons for that. Like if you have a healthy right. ecosystem, obviously it's going to go wetter, wet, better with pests. Um, but yeah, there's this concept of like the the bricks that a plant um, can like absorb. And if it's like has the nutrients it needs, then it's less attractive to pests in theory. Um, so that's kind of my theory of like what's up out here is that the soil quality is not as good as it could be right now because um, it is wild like i've i didn't even know there were that many kinds of aphids like mm. i've had the green aphids i've had like these black and white spotted ones i've had like the brown ones the black one, like so many different kinds that just like decimate um a lot of the plants uh and then like the leaf miners are a big problem um i had what are they oh um uh, not gnats Something was eating my grapes. Uh, it was, yeah, there were just like a lot of problems. And then the voles and then the imported pests from the nursery that I got the trees from. Like, it was hard dealing with them all. Um, but ultimately, like, you know, there's not much I can like really do about it. I do prefer to use organic or permaculture inspired methods. So I'm not going to go like get a spray and just get rid of them. I kind of want to just sit and observe and see what I can do to encourage like the natural systems involved. So I've learned a lot from that. Um, it was like a huge challenge and definitely causing me a lot of grief at some points, but it's also given me the opportunity to see like, if I leave the weeds to grow, it distracts the pests from my actual crops. So like, can I kind of leave some of those in strategic locations or leave as many as possible that aren't in my way and use that to my advantage. And then I can often mm -hmm. use those to feed the rabbits. And so I'm kind of creating slowly like more of an ecosystem, like with whatever was eating my um, grapes, uh, I read that pirate bugs are a natural predator to those and they often like like daisies. And so I went and I I uh, picked some like wildflowers that had bugs crawling all over them and I just kind of left them near my grapes and it worked mm. out. I don't know if it was actually what I did that made it work out, but like the pest problem stopped. So just kind of like to it. it. Yeah. So what would you, what would you say is the best part about just the freedom of like being able to do, do what you want? Yeah, I was going to say that the freedom, the creativity, like, um, I can do anything I want, pretty much like the area that I'm in too, there's no like real zoning restrictions, you can really do whatever you want, for the most part. And people in this area are really on that vibe too. like people just do whatever they want, they'll paint their house, whatever color they want, they'll have garbage all over their lawn, like, <laughs> it's like, what they want to do, they do it. And so I do it. I just like get into the vibe and like build whatever I want, grow whatever I want. And I can come up with some really like interesting and creative ways to just like 
you know, grow the homestead or go out and forage and have fun. And like, yeah, like, you know, it's been a tough winter with my divorce and everything. And I haven't been working as much as I would have liked to. And so money is low, but like, I live in an RV in the woods. Like that's not that big of a deal. So like there's this amazing amount of freedom that I never really had before. Uh, and I, I love it. It's, I couldn't go back. <laughs> I think also you're chosen, like you've chosen to work from home, which allows you, you said that you like sit and observe your garden. I think being able to like, that's almost like a luxury when you're uh, growing things, whether it be plants or raising livestock, um, mm -hmm. you can just, you, you have more time to sit and observe and like notice certain patterns of things. Whereas like a lot of people, they, they're like weekend gardeners, basically like they, they have to, all the crap that happened during the week that kind of got away from them. They have to catch up on the weekend and it goes back to all the crap during the week and then catch up on the weekend. Whereas like you can kind of be in it every day and interact and observe that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Like my garden doesn't need a lot of babysitting and care. I mostly try and do like pretty like permaculture e type techniques that are very like leave it and let it grow. Um, but permaculture techniques and I think just like, you know, my life philosophy and ha my values like necessitate that sit and observe. And so I'll go take my laptop out in the garden and do my meetings from there and I can see what happens, you know, what birds come by, what pests, what whatever is happening. Uh, and I, I learn a lot from it, just being able to go out. Like in the summer, I go and forage uh, either in the fields or around my garden or whatever uh, and feed them to the rabbits. They don't really have pellets as much in the summer. They have like a little bit to supplement, but like I'll get like a bag this big and that'll last me like a mm. whole month because they eat just whatever I pick for them. So three times a day, I go out, do my little rounds and like imagine how much I get to see and learn just in those three times a day during the yeah. day, you know? Whereas like, you know, like I work, uh, I work outside the home my wife is home with like two kids. And so like, we're both got like busy things going on. And so, so I set up a deer feeder to dispense chicken feed two times a day. And so like that, like, yes, that's convenient, but it also takes away like that observation of like, Hey, how are the chickens doing? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I haven't been out there all day because I haven't had to. And so it's almost like, counter to what you want so i don't know i'm still i'm still developing like my own systems like does that is this actually beneficial or am i just lazy <laughs> <laughs> well you know laziness can be good i think on the home side you got to conserve sure. energy you know so That's like true. certain things if you can automate them why wouldn't you but also it is nice to just like experience it if you build all of this and then never actually go out and just sit there and, and enjoy it like is it worth it I oh, do like nice. doing like I can only sit and like look at the chickens for so long like I have to be like working around them like that's kind of like my observation and we can see them from the from the dining room um just look out your window and like oh that one kind of looks funny like is that one okay it's kind of limping or something and mm -hmm. you go go look at it after that but last weekend I had raked out it took me a while but i raked out all the deep litter from the chicken coop and had to like get it wet and then pile it up and uh pull out some more wood chips to get that wet and then make it make a big pile and then tarp it so that was me like working in and around the chickens kind of like observing but also like mm -hmm. doing something and then so i can create like this really nice really nice compost so, like i'm looking forward to checking it this week this weekend, um, pulling some back and putting my hand in there to see if it's hot. Mm. So like, that's, that's probably like my favorite part is, uh, seeing if what I've done all year, it's has created like good compost for the growing year, like mm -hmm. for like when we're, we're coming up. So. 
I feel that compost is so exciting. What a re- like rewarding and <laughs> yeah. I mean it's labor intensive sometimes, but it's one of those things that you kind of do while you're observing other things. So it's this nice like side benefit, you know? Yeah, I was. I took a picture last year where I was like, "What is this white stuff?" Uh, kind of like in my garden bed. Like, what is what is this? And someone's like, "That's I don't know." I can't remember what they said. It was like mycelium or something like that. Some sort of like fungus. They're like, that's really good. You want that? I'm like, oh, because I got like loads of it. And like I pulled back some more and it just like penetrated, you know, all the way down to the garden bed. So it's got like, I, I got good fungal growth in the, uh, in the soil. So that is good. Yeah. Having a fungal, whatever I was doing is working. <laughs> I feel that the soil out here is very fungal dominant, which is like super exciting to me. I'm very into fungus. So when I see like, yeah, the the snow mold or the like white patches in the soil, I'm like, hmm, this could be good. This is yeah. Good. <laughs> what would you tell people that want to get started homesteading or living in an RV or uh, moving into the woods? <laughs> All of it. I would say like, if it's something you truly want to do just do it. Like, I think a lot of people, they dream of it, they aspire to it, they have kind of this idea in the back of their mind that it would be like something really cool for them. Um, But either, one thing I see is that people are not actually prepared for it. Like, I see in the local homesteading group so many people who just like, they don't do their research, they just have this sort of homesteady dream, and then they go out there and it doesn't work out for them. And within a year, they have to sell the whole property because they got too many animals to start with Mm -hmm. more than they could manage or they didn't actually know they suck at growing a garden and they didn't do any research ahead of time to like learn how to do that so like definitely like be prepared but there are also so many people that I know who have these dreams to do something like this but you know with the way the economy is with the way life is sort of set up to trap you in cities and trap you in the system uh, and these cycles like they're never going to break out of that unless they do something really radical so that would be my advice is like take stock think about like what could you live with what could you live without I don't think a lot of people could live the lifestyle that I'm living to be fair most people are not going to be happy camping 24 7 and not having running water but like Think about what you can live without. Like, can you strip this dream back to its basics and build from there? Because that's the only way you're going to get there. Like all these people who buy their house, they move out here from Ontario and they've got their Ontario house money um, and they get Ontario house money. It's a big thing out here. Everyone's pissed about it. It's like properties are like really expensive there. And so they've got all this money and they come out here and they drive up. Same thing here. Exactly the same thing. (laughs) There's a lot of bitterness about it, which I get. Uh, I feel like I'm exempt from that because I'm bringing property values down. I live in a trash, little trash corner here. (laughs) (laughs) We could have a series of RVs on all your neighbor's (laughs) property. Like, Hmm? <laughs> I'll call it a rustic Airbnb. I don't know. Do whatever you want with it. <laughs> Pretty much. Honestly, I feel like I'm inspiring a lot of the neighbors to get on that vibe too. Like there are more RVs popping Just burn up, your house like- down. Start over. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. One of my neighbors came by and was like, you know, I was telling my wife we should do something like this. He's, he got let go from his job because he wouldn't get vaccinated. And he was like, I was saying we should sell the house and and just like do an RV, go off grid like this. And I was like, honestly, do it. Like, I love it. I recommend it. You guys <laughs> could just be like a bunch of gypsies, just like. <laughs> <laughs> just chilling out in the woods. Like it's, I love it. Again, like I would recommend it to anybody, but I don't think anybody could live this lifestyle. So it that takes would a be certain mindset for like, sure strip it back, find what your basic can be. Like, you're not gonna come out here with your Ontario house money and buy like 20 different animals that you can't actually care for. Like you need to build up to these things. So it's actually good to strip that dream back and start from very little and add little bits at a time, see what you Mm -hmm. can manage. Um, Yeah, just like find what's in your means right now and do it, get out there figure it out because yeah it is like deeply deeply rewarding and there's no other way it's gonna happen unless you just do it exactly yeah and you don't have to go so like if you're you know in ontario or whatever major city you don't have to go all the way to the other spectrum to be like in the middle of the woods you can find that medium like that's Mm -hmm. okay and then once you're just like outside of the city like plan a little bit ahead like 
cities typically get bigger. So like give yourself a good buffer. Mm-hmm. And then once you're once you're out of that that you got to find that fringe zone, right? You can still have your job in the city. You just just start changing your lifestyle just little increments at a time, reducing your, you know, dependence on like the grocery store, Costco, going to Target, whatever. Um I mean, small small adjustments like that over the course of a year two give it five years and your life's going to look really different than when you first moved to that that property so absolutely it doesn't doesn't take a lot and i think of like people back home in ottawa like the ottawa ottawa amalgamated a lot of the rural areas around it so like you can still live in ottawa and live kind of rurally like there are a lot of opportunities for people to just get like a little bit further out a little Mm. bit more home study a little bit more sustainable and like you know a lot of what inspired me to do this is i'm just like really really into the concept of food sovereignty and so if that's what inspires you like try urban gardening like there's urban farming techniques there are lots of different things that you can do to integrate that into your lifestyle like bit by bit by bit and like mm-hmm. you know paul wheaton has the skip curriculum specifically for apartments like you can still learn and prepare yourself for these things and see if it's actually right for you um living your life now like it's it can be incremental obviously i took like a huge plunge in coming out here uh so who am i to talk about incremental but, but you were set up for it like yeah. you, you were able to, so everyone has to like work within their means. Like you are able to take a giant leap forward. A lot of and people can't, and they got to figure that. it out. Like, I did this giant leap forward and like, yes, I had basically what I needed, but I also didn't get chickens and rabbits and all these things all at once. I did go like really hard with the garden right away, but that was within my means for mm-hmm. the year. You know, like I work from home. It's easier for me to just like take a break and go shovel in buckets of compost and dirt into the raised garden beds. Like I had the ability to do that. So why not? But yeah, like work within your means, find what you can do, make changes and just can do you it. Tell, can you tell people really quick what uh, Paul Whedon's skip program is? Yeah. So skills to inherit property. Um, it's like a very interesting set of tasks that you can do to prove that you are capable of homesteading, um, especially within like a permaculture lens. And uh, once you get like enough of them done, um, there are these people that he calls Otises, who are people who want to will their property to somebody who will do what they want with it, basically. Like, these are people who might not have children who want to carry on the the homesteading dream. And like, they just want to save their property from becoming industrialized uh like industrial egg or Mm -hmm. development or whatever uh and so they want to find somebody who's going to continue the lifestyle and what they have built on their property and basically yeah they'll like will their property to you or have you come work with them and build the property until they're ready to retire and move and pass on or whatever um there are lots of different situations a lot of different uh people who are Otis's and their situations are different. So yeah, you do these tasks, you get your badges uh, to prove that you have these skills to inherit property. And maybe somebody goes, oh, this seems like somebody who would be great to inherit my property. That is a great solution for a lot of people that it, it bridges that gap where like, I don't have access to land, like do, start learning stuff and pe- people just might hand you something or, mm-hmm. you know, even if you have to pay for the property, like that was a like a connection you wouldn't have had otherwise. So and skills you wouldn't have otherwise, maybe like you, you can learn a lot from the skip program. It's not like hand fed to you. It's kind of just assigned to you and you have the responsibility to figure out like how to do these tasks, but that's really valuable. Like those research skills, learning and trial and error, like those are all really important, whether you buy a property or inherit a property or not, like that opportunity mm-hmm. is really great to prepare you for homesteading. And yeah, I mean, like, if we're talking about how to get started and just get out there and do it, like, that's a great step forward. It's like, test your skills, prove your abilities, and maybe someone takes note and actually gives you the property. Maybe you can't afford it, and that's fine. Yeah, there's there's a solution out there. You just gotta get creative and figure out what, what your limits are, so. 
Yeah. And if there's anything I've learned from like living in the community I live in now is like people will just give you things. P- things will just fall into your hands. So like yes. if you if you put the work in and and live your dream, like it'll happen. I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I got to get ready for work. But yeah. what uh, can you tell people where they can find you? Yeah. Learn so you more. Can find me on Twitter at Lomi girl 15 Lomi like soil um, also have like TikTok and Tumblr and YouTube under that name. Um, but I don't really use them yet. I don't really use my Twitter that much yet either. I will now that the sure. season is impending. Um, yeah, that's mostly where you can find me. Also like permies.com. I'm always keeping around there, obviously. So come check out, ask questions, find out how to homestead and uh, you'll get my emails every now and then. Sure. I will what what draw like what drew me to you is that you're like yes it's at Lomi Girl 15 but your like name is Dirt Queen Soil Royal that's <laughs> I like it that's funny thank you I like so, it too I love dirt I love dirt it's it's good quality <laughs> so hey uh, I've appreciated appreciate your time and this has been a really fun conversation so yeah thanks well, so uh, much for I'm, me. I'm, yes thank you I'll uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what you put out uh, this year so. Thanks. Likewise. Have a great day. Thank you. You too.